So um, I don't know whether I need to introduce Madalena Kay, but I will very, very briefly. So you, you are a multi-talented uh, British European, European British. Yeah, uh, European first. Yeah, okay, European, ci European citizen first and coming from the UK, that, right, the right way to, to put it. And, and you were uh, campaigning uh, very strongly to prevent Britain from leaving the UK uh, and mm -hmm. uh, with a lot of success actually in terms of the number of people who followed you and you also toured Europe to try to discuss with everybody concerned. Uh, you're um, also an artist, a writer, a musician and of course a political activist and you were awarded the Young European of the Year in 2018. And you're also known, known as the AU Supergirl uh, for your creative work and campaigning in, in, in Britain. And you won many, many, many different awards. I won't have the time to give them all, but you can <laughs> go to your website, madalenakay.com, where everything is explained. Uh, I think the last, what is your last award? I think it was in 2020 for the, your, your project of Future is Europe, the um, Charlemagne Youth Prize? Yes, that right? so that's um, the, the EU do the Charlemagne Youth Prize every year and they select a national winner right. for each country and then they get everybody together for an award ceremony to pick the top three of the national winners. But because of this year with COVID, they've had to like postpone everything so i won the national the uk uh, charlemagne youth prize but they've not uh, like announced um the top three winners yet because it's everything's just on hold okay okay and as a singer and songwriter you've you've performed you know in, in many many different places in europe in strasbourg and uh in the uk of course in in in, in poland um and um in berlin so you you, you have like a triple of or career in a way, and you also published eight books, is that right, in the last yeah. uh, four years? Uh, and you also won a postcard award. Could you imagine say oh, yeah. so That's also what you saw everybody in the Facebook um, uh, presentation we made of this event tonight. Yes, um, the postcard, uh, it was the great British postcard competition, um, was... Um, uh, in 2017 and it was uh, one of my book covers and it was all the politicians but as uh, the characters from Alice in Wonderland. Okay, so. okay. and uh, and I think your microphone is off, Magdalena. I can see it's off, okay. And you portray different um, uh, break delay and I think you have a friend. I don't know whether he joined us yet. He can't join until um, eight or nine. Okay, so when he will join at eight, maybe you can show his portrait that you made. Yes. <laughs> okay, and explain why you made that particular portrait. Uh, okay, so we will introduce him later. So it's very quickly uh, for everybody, I'm Catherine, and I'm here with uh, Gian Paolo, Lise, Paul, and Francesca. We basically you've got the team of Fox Europe here. Um, and of course, we, we, we would like you to, for the ones who haven't done it, you can read Madalena's uh, article we published uh, this morning on Vox Europe's website. And uh, maybe my, the first question I'd have would be, how does it feel today, right now in Britain for you and for, for young people around you, just to, as we are approaching Brexit for, for good? Um, it's really depressing and a bit scary. Um, every time I turn on the news and hear about what's happening with the Brexit negotiations, I just feel this. Somebody has the microphone on. Could you make sure everybody that you shut it? So otherwise we can hear what you're saying. Okay, sorry, Madeleine, you can go ahead. ahead. Yeah, I just feel this like real sense of dread, I guess. Um, and um, I just the the utter incompetence of um, our our government. Um, it's um, it doesn't really give you a lot of confidence in um, in the future of the UK. 
Um, and I think that the U I, I think like Boris Johnson's demands and what um, his party wants um, is is unreasonable and not obtainable, and therefore we're sort of careering towards a no deal, and they're just being um, um, kind of insincere about the actual consequences that's going to have on um, UK trade economy. And then ultimately on people's lives, um, because you know we're going to see the job market affected. We're going to see disruption to medicines and food, and a lot of unknowns. And it's just this yeah. kind of sense of chaos and dread, it, balancing on um, the precipice of a cliff edge, mm. and not knowing if 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 we're going to fall over the edge or if um, we can save ourselves. Um, but I mean, the reality is that even any the deal that's on the table is still um, it's not a good future for the UK. It's like, do you want something that's bad or do you want something that's worse? Mm -hmm. um, that's the choice we're being faced with. And um, I don't think there's the political will even um, for to to stop the the no deal, which the the no the no deal will ultimately be a lot worse outcome for both the eu and for the uk but the problem is that um the boris johnson if he gets a deal has got to like sell it to the british people and be like i've got this deal it's a great future for the uk and it's not going to be a great future for the uk just because brexit is not a good future and it's not going to bring opportunities and it is going to cause damage so if they go for no deal they can just say oh well it was all the eu's fault they were just being right. unreasonable and that's my fear that we will end up with no deal and um do you think young people would buy problem. that do you think they'll buy young people do you think they're going to buy that argument that it's the eu's fault it doesn't seem like it from here the nationalists sure buy that argument um because they're always looking for a scapegoat it's it's like um they sold Brexit to the British people by blaming the EU for a load of stuff that wasn't the EU's fault. Um, and so they'll do the same here with, uh, you know, with a no deal. They'll say, oh, well, it was the EU's fault that we couldn't get a better deal because their demands were being unreasonable. Um, where the young people who majority voted um, to remain will buy it, I don't think. Um, we we know that the government is responsible for this mess. The problem I find with young people, though, is um, there's a huge amount of apathy and um, lack of engagement. And I mean, even myself, I feel it at the moment. Like I I just like when I hear about Brexit, I'm like, oh my god, I just don't want to hear about it anymore because we're powerless to do anything. Um, this is in the hands of Boris Johnson and the, the Tory, uh, the far right wing, and there's nothing that we can do. So there's a huge amount of um, of apathy and disdain. Okay, we would already have a number of questions, but just before we take them, I have a pressing question. I, I, I saw that you describe yourself like others as a rejoiner. And I just wanted to know whether you see that perspective as a real possibility in the near future or maybe even in in your lifetime of course you know maybe not right now as we took so long to untangle the ties and maybe they won't be entangled actually uh, as much as they hope or brother johnson's government hope so um, but, so what's your what's your hope and what's your the perspectives we can we could see well somebody tweeted the other day um that they hope that um, uh, Nigel Farage sees the UK rejoin the EU before he dies. That's also my hope. Uh, I retweeted that. Um, I, I think you never achieve anything unless you believe that the achievement is possible. And without vision and drive and commitment, um, it's not going to happen. You have to work to make things happen. Nobody serves things up to you on a plate. So if we want the UK to rejoin the EU, then we've got to make it happen. 
So it is definitely a possibility. You should never say never. Anything is possible. The question is how to achieve this goal. And I think that, um, that it is possible, but I think the UK is going to have to suffer the consequences of Brexit first. Awesome. Um, in, um, during my Brexiles project, um, which um, I interviewed 27 EU, uh, British citizens living across the EU, and this guy here is in Cyprus. Uh, his name's Richard Fairhead, and he said something to me in his interview, which is in the book, which is that he wants the UK to suffer the natural consequences of their actions. So he said when, when his children um, were younger, um, they would advise them against making a mistake, but if the children wanted to do the thing against their parents' advice, he said he wanted them to suffer natural consequences of their actions so that they learn from their mistakes. And he said the same applies to the UK, that we are going to have to experience the impacts of Brexit to realise what it is that we've lost um, as uh, members of the EU. And only then, once we've come to the realisation that actually this was a mistake, we get off our high horse and um, um, be humble about it and say, yeah, we need to backtrack. Um, and yeah, I ultimately hope that this will happen, but I think realistically we're looking at 20 years time. Okay, so yeah, almost a, gen a generation. It took Nigel Farage that long to get us out of the EU, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, about, yeah, <laughs> that's true. Uh, Gian Paolo, do you, do you want to go ahead with another question? Yeah, th there's something I, I was really curious about. Uh, Martina, you are one of the few people uh, who are not uh, professional politicians or EU officials who have visited all the 28, 27 <laughs> EU member states. Um, did this uh, give you a kind of, of unique or at least very rare uh, vision from uh, vision of the whole of it? What is your sense after, uh, after having visited all the countries? Is the EU really something special, something uh, uh, unique, or is there a kind of common identity? Or Well, I think what was interesting for me um, during my tour was that I was doing it from the perspective of um, of an artist and an activist as opposed to you know diplomats who will be going in um f with a different agenda doing different activities meeting you know in certain types of uh, you know institution places whereas i was going really to um examine the the cultural diversity and try and document that and celebrate that and talk to people activists um across europe who are not in high powered positions but share this sentiment um, of being european and being european before your own nationality i think i think that's what um i sort of found in common with a lot of the other pro-eu activists i met during my travels but also i think m my book uh, the future is europe which is the one that won the charlemagne the uk charlemagne youth prize that was really an attempt to document that cultural diversity and to say, look, each nation state um, has so much about its own national heritage to celebrate that is unique and diverse, um, but there is no need for nationalism because what the EU does um, is uh, not to create a monoculture, which is what a lot of the Brexiteers argue, but actually the EU celebrates that diversity and encourages us to share in, um, to share in our you know, traditions and our um, you know, cultural achievements and to learn from each other's experiences um, uh, and, and achievements. And I think you get a, a rich cultural dialogue from cross-border conversations and I guess my, um, my tour, uh, the, the Future is Europe tour, was about trying to, um, to uh, acknowledge that diversity, 
but um, bring everybody together in a shared conversation. And the majority of that dialogue happened actually on social media. So whenever I went to a country and I would be taking photos of, um, of uh, you know, unique cultural points and also making my sketches and watercolour paintings of, um, you know, certain things in that country, I'd get, you know, an outpouring from people that had either uh, lived there or visited there or come from that country who wanted to also share their love um and joy for uh for that for, for their net for that nation but in a context where it was you know um every everyone is an equal and i treated each country equally and respected um respected them for their uniqueness hey thank you um maybe i could already bring in a question from um uh phil jones who is your hero or heroine in the field of art and who in the development of the institutions of the European Union do you most admire? Oh gosh. Um, that's tricky. Um, so um, one artist that I um, really admire and I follow on um, Instagram and um, I actually met him on a couple of occasions is Jeremy Della um in the uk because he uh he's kind of he's not like a conventional artist in the sense of like um you know uh, like like visual art painting and stuff um kind of like i do but he does uh um he he's he focuses on political issues and he makes uh documentaries um he he did this poster campaign um around um london um where he did uh, this strong and stable my ass poster when Theresa May came out with her we are a strong and stable government line so he's kind of witty and funny but he's also very good at getting like a very simple message out everywhere and like when Brexit was happening he did like um, an immigrants um, a welcome kind of poster initiative as well um, and um, what I really like is his documentaries and I saw one of them at Sheffield Dock Fest and it was actually looking at um, um, the acid house movement and how like rave culture was a response to um, um, the politics um, um, in the UK um, of um, uh, the kind of right wing politics and how um, this kind of culture of hedonism like gave people uh, freedom to express themselves and to rebel against the authorities but he like um, took this um, issue and then put it in the context of of, of, of Brexit and um, uh, the anti-immigrant culture that we uh, uh, have now under the right-wing government and um, sort of I the, the kind of message I got from that was like a need for a countercultural revolution of like bringing people together through um uh through like a shared cultural activity or moment and he also did another documentary which was about the uh the uh the, the far right and the um uh, the anti-far right protests and the remain uh, pro-eu protesters outside parliament um, which was really informative and interesting so I really, I, I admire his work. I follow him on Instagram um, and um, yeah, I look forward to seeing um, what he does. So, and then who do I admire in the development of the institutions? Oh gosh, um, technical. Well, so last year I got the opportunity to um, travel to Ventatene in Italy. Um, which is the island off the, the west coast um, where the fascist uh, regime um, locked up political prisoners during the war. Mm -hmm. And one of the people they locked up was Altiero Spilelli and he wrote the Ventitani Manifesto on the island. And um, for me, that was like, I didn't know about this before I went, I was invited to film this documentary on the island. And it was a really like 
moving and eye-opening experience to me to see kind of like where the conception of this idea of the EU happened um, whilst this man was um, incarcerated in, in this in this prison on this you know tiny island and it must have been really dark times for him and you know the idea of um, is social um, our social isolation during the COVID pandemic is nothing compared to being locked up in in a prison cell and he got through it through this writing and through this idea and this vision and I think that we need to apply that same motivation and that same vision to um, to our conversations and our uh, work for to you know fight for the future of Europe because if we don't have that same conviction then Europe's just going to fall apart because the fascist Nigel Farage, Viktor Orban, they they will destroy the EU from the inside out given the chance um, and the drive, drive ourselves, they will win. Okay. I was afraid that you'd say um, give a Hofstadt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who well, might he's, he's a personable politician and I admire him for his um, character you know his characterfulness and engagement particularly on social media he's very good at getting attention and getting message out etc but um yeah. no, no. He, good choice Pinelli. you know he's an mep that's and paulo i think i think simon um he, if he he's he's the simon that madena was expecting ah. at this point he arrived there huh? Oh, um, I don't know yeah. if I recognize him. Maybe not, maybe that's another Simon. Okay, then he would be ahead of schedule anyway. So maybe you can take uh, another question from Mix Selmins from Latvia, who is saying that he's asking if you're also planning to leave the UK, maybe to go to Latvia. In this case, uh, he knows an organization that helps newcomers to settle in, it's Make Room. Um, and anyway, Mix hopes that the UK will find a way back to the EU. So it's a statement, a question, and also a, a kind of tip, should you move to Latvia? <laughs> Latvia, yeah. I, um, I, I actually really enjoyed visiting the Baltic countries because again, I didn't know much about them and I hadn't visited them before last year. And they really it opened my eye and it also opened my eyes to what the EU was doing to support these countries because of the Rail Baltica scheme. Uh, I travel between the countries by coach because the roads are the best way to travel around there because the um, railway is so, um, uh, it's a, well, it's a bit of a mess um, at the moment, which is why they're putting in so much investment and the nation states are putting in part of the funding the eu is putting in funding to the whole scheme and it's going to join them all up and benefit them economically so actually i think the baltic's kind of like a up and coming area of um of the eu and it's got such a rich um heritage and culture and like all the old towns are just so beautiful and charming um uh, but then also there's a lot of cool new architecture and things going on. Um, and so Simon, who will join us shortly, is... Um, is uh, yeah, from... Ah, here he is! Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was hoping actually over the summer to come to Latvia on a holiday, but then um, the COVID travel restrictions, um, we ended up going to Poland instead, but I'm still hoping at some point to uh, to get there so that Simon can show me around personally. <laughs> Would you like, Madelena, uh, to, to introduce uh, Simon more than I did earlier? And Yes. So um, I, I did my, uh, I did a Brexiles project um, during the last year. So when the lockdown was happening, I was working from home, connecting, um uh, to citizens british citizens um through social media um who were living in the eu member states who'd moved there where brexit was like um one of the contributing factors to their decision to to leave the uk 
um, and um, I uh, found one person for each EU member state. So Simon is uh, the one from Latvia. Um, this was the portrait that I did of him, uh, which is a bit crazy. Um, the style is uh, kind of cubist because what I was trying to do was like um, explore this idea of fragmented identities. So, you know, um, with um, the rise of nationalism, um, in the UK, the shifting political landscape, a lot of people feel that like a country that was their home um, and they felt that they belonged to, actually they don't feel at home and comfortable um, in the UK anymore. And that's like affected their sense of, you know, British identity versus European identity. Some of my other participants had other issues like um, their LGBT um, identities, uh, which sometimes they, they found in conflict with, uh, you know, cultures of intolerance um, and anyway um, Simon we chose uh, uh, this color scheme um, with the purple background uh, because he um, he told me about uh, one of his um, favorite uh, bands which is Go Gold Bordello and they have this song which is called Stop Wearing Purple um, which I can highly recommend. Um, and I also saw Simon do um, a cover uh, version with his band of, uh, of this song on um, Facebook after I'd done this portrait, which um, really um, was a lovely thing to watch. <laughs> Simon, would you like to explain um, how you moved from Britain to Latvia? Um, Whether yeah. you're in Latvia or not? Uh, I'm in Latvia now, yeah. Yeah. In Riga. Um, so, yeah, well, basically, I, I don't know if anyone read the, the interviews that, that Maddie did some, some, how long was it ago? Six months ago? Yeah, it was about so, then. Um, so, yeah, it was, I left UK, I think, March in 2018. Uh, for the, well, Initially, I just left to go traveling, and well, I, I moved. I was living in Sheffield for my master's degree. Uh, I moved out from Sheffield uh, in March of that year because, well, similar reasons to a lot of people, I was getting kind of tired of the rhetoric and the political situation and, and everything like that. And so, kind of, I just ended up in Latvia a bit by accident. It wasn't, I didn't deliberately choose Latvia, I was just originally traveling here, and then. And, and, this just happened to be where I settled. Um, I was thinking originally anywhere in the EU outside of the UK, but um, yeah, Latvia happened, happened a bit by accident. But yeah. And um, you said to me that um, you went to Latvia to see a gig of um, the um, one of the Eastern European bands, but you also right. studied that for your um, master's degree, didn't you? Yeah, I was studying my master's degree in ethnomusicology, um, so I was I was already doing my dissertation on, on Eastern European folk music and particularly Russian folk music. So bands like Leningrad and Gogol Bordello were pretty big influences there, and I ended up here in, in Latvia. Originally, I came for the concerts, and and I two and a half years later, still here. Okay, and how do you see what's happening in Britain from where you are? Having it's left now for more than two years. Kind of mixture of viewpoints. I mean, I'm still getting a lot of the news back from the UK and still reading a lot of newspapers from the UK, but I'm also getting a local viewpoint of it here as well. Um, I get a lot of people asking me all the time, um, Brexit, why? Mm. Basically, not often in, in such terms, but yeah. Um, a lot of people here, again, are very confused about it and then. Here in Latvia, a lot of people ask me to kind of explain what does Brexit mean and like why any country would do that. I guess same. Well, traveling a lot in other EU countries, I've had similar kind of questions anyway. Um, but it's it's not something the news in Latvia is covering too much anymore, as much as they used to a few years ago. But at the moment, it's, it's been a bit quiet. Okay, thank you. I don't think that's just the case for Latvia. I think um, um, there's, you know, all the European countries are basically sick of um, reporting on Brexit now, and it's kind of um, 
it's yeah the public's getting sick of hearing it i think to some um, extent yeah okay will you bring in some maybe some more questions that we can go back and and take some more input uh from you afterwards uh, Maybe I take the, the question from Marie. Jean Paolo, you can take the one from Leslie. And I know that Phil Jones asked two more questions, but give the priority first to people who didn't ask questions, who, whose question have been put out yet. So a question from Marie, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, Howie. Hi, Madi. We first met at the first demo in London at the Red Lion pub. And so I, I admire all your work. My question is, when did you realize that you just had to make such huge commitment to your campaign work, to your campaigning to work? <laughs> um, yeah, so it's fairly common knowledge that I um, dropped out of my university degree in 2016. Um, about, oh gosh, it must have been like sort of uh, November time. Um, because um, after the Brexit vote had happened in June, I got really involved in the movement like over the summer holidays i um i wrote this children's this was my first uh, children's book that i did about refugees um and uh, that was kind of in response to this huge um rise in hate crime that we saw um after the um after the uh, the vote because what brexit kind of did was it validated um the um uh, the xenophobia and the um, anti-immigrant hate and that led to a spike of you know um, uh, violence and hate crime against refugees and migrants in the UK and so I wanted to do something to kind of challenge this narrative so I wrote this children's book um, uh, uh, about refugees um, and uh, that kind of told the story of refugees in an empathetic uh, context and um, I did a crowdfunding campaign to self-publish this and then I sold it in aid of my local refugee movement, um, the City of Sanctuary. So I was doing that um, and trying to manage that and then started back at uni in, um, in September and um, then I kept uh, getting requests to um, participate in campaigning stunts, to perform at events and um, there was a there was a point where um, uh, I was asked to do a, a design for a, like um, an ad van um, uh, outside the Supreme Courts of, uh, of Justice, and um, um, it took me like you know a, a week or something to do this artwork for it, and I just got to the point where I was like, I've either got to I've either got to drop my degree or I've got to stop doing the activism. And for me, I don't know, the just the thought of the UK outside of the EU and the damage that was going to do to young people and our future prospects was kind of enough of a motivation for me to um, suspend my studies at the University of Sheffield. And that was, um, that was towards the end of um, 2016. And, you know, in the last uh, four years since then, I've done uh, a lot of stuff that I wasn't expecting that I didn't, you know, I, I had no idea what I was doing really when I made that decision. But I'm the kind of person that takes every you know opportunity that's given to me um, um, and, you know, puts in the effort um, to, to make things happen. Because like I said earlier, like, nothing happens unless you make it happen so just to kind of sit back and accept things with complacency uh, and just be like we can't we can't do anything uh, it's not my problem it's not really my ethic um <laughs> okay okay so there's a question from phil jones um he phil jones wants to know um, what would you like to see on sc on school curricula? And as a child, did you get to stay with a family in another country or host a child from another country in your home? I guess that might be a reason why you are so curious about uh, uh, going abroad and um, meeting people from um, all over Europe. Um, so I 
think the political education in the UK is really poor. Um, I mean, I went to state school. I don't know what it's like in private education, but for the majority of English children, what they learn about politics is is negligible. I didn't know anything about how the UK Parliament works at all um, before I started campaigning. I wasn't really that political politically active. I I remember the first election that I voted in, I um, I put a sign up outside my house jokingly uh, to say, um, vote for the monster raving loony party because all the politicians are as bad as each other. And I think I ended up voting green, which is probably in most aligned with my politics, uh, but was also a completely wasted vote in, in um, my constituency. And I didn't learn about the, you know, like the first past the post system and and how actually undemocratic that is and unfair that is until, you know, um, until I started campaigning, getting involved in politics, because they just don't teach it to you in schools. And I remember um, uh, before the 2019 uh, EU elections, um, speaking to um, a friend of mine who's um, a, a, she's a doctor um, and she said to me, I don't actually know what the MEPs do. What's the European Parliament for? Mm. You know, she's a doctor. She's very clever, but we are just not taught this in schools. And if you're not interested to find out yourself, then you just don't know. And she ended up, she didn't vote in the European parliamentary elections. And I was, I can understand that because like, why would you care about something you don't even know about? Um, and so I would like better political education on the school system in the UK, firstly about British politics, just so that kids are informed when they make a vote in um, UK elections, and also that they're even motivated to vote because a lot of uh, a lot of people still don't vote in the UK. Um, and you know, I would have hoped that there'd be more education about EU politics, but obviously that's not happening anytime soon in the UK with the direction that the country is um, heading with Brexit. Um, and in terms of my own um, upbringing, um, when I was um, a, a child, um, uh, my, my parents divorced when I was 10, but before that, um, we had this big house with two spare bedrooms and they used to rent these bedrooms out to lodgers and the lodgers were they were their students from the university because they're both university teachers and they used to um invite um it was usually the master students who were from foreign countries to come and stay in our house so when i was growing up we had lodgers from from russia from um uh, from china japan uh from all over europe and um oh and uh, from argentina so um and some of them my parents still kept in contact with. We went to South Africa once to see one of them. Um, so I had this quite international upbringing and I learned about different cultures and met these different people. Um, but um, in terms of hosting a child, um, we did actually. I never had the opportunity myself to go on an exchange um, because my school uh, the schools that i went to were not uh, they had very little funding for languages arts um and um the the french exchange was cancelled um before my year group had that opportunity but my older brother um was like the last year group that got to go on the french exchange and he went to france to stay with the family and then of course the the boy from that family came to um to stay with us um and uh, i don't know i i um um i remember my mum saying that like i was um hanging around with him more than my brother who was ignoring ignoring him a bit <laughs> okay there there is a question for simon Let's, um will really go back to the uk one day um, as, as in to visit or, or to live there? The question that was asked by someone, I, can't, I don't know who, but um, listening to us, I mean... Maybe answer both. <laughs> Is it? Uh, I, I, I come back about once a year to visit my parents, I guess. Um, last time I was there was end of February. Obviously, travel's been a bit difficult this year. Um, 
going back to live in UK, though I, I, I don't see myself living there again anytime soon. Um, obviously, something can change as I get older, but uh, it's not something I'm planning on in, in the next five, seven years or anything like that. Okay. And um, Simon, you um, you grew up in Dover, didn't you? Yeah. And you put me uh, into contact with um, my Brexile from um, the Czech Republic. Thomas, yeah. Because he went to to school with you. Yeah, we we knew each other in school. Yeah, basically, we were in the school together. Were you like? Um, were, were you friends at school? Close friends, or was it like afterwards that you got? Yeah. Back? Close friends at school, but, but we had a lot of the same classes and had a bunch of fun with one of us. A lot of the time, yeah. And do you ever do you ever meet up um, now that you're both on the continent? Um, we've talked about him coming to visit Riga or me going down to Prague at some point. We haven't made that happen yet. Um, last time when I was in Dover, he happened to be back at the same time as well. So we, we did go out for a beer then and catch up and everything. But we, we talk occasionally, but, but we're not like going over to the Riga and Prague to visit every two months. Like <laughs> Certainly not in COVID time. Not in um, COVID I time. found the portrait. This, this one's uh, Thomas. Okay. <laughs> They're the only two um, Brexiles in my book that um, they know each other. Right. Okay. There's a related question from Elwyn Jones. Which is the best EU country for, for Brexit refugees? Oh, um, interesting. Um, well, each of my... my um, Brexiles had their own story and their own reasons for choosing the country that they went to. So quite often um, they would um, be going to the country because their partner uh, was, was from that country. So like the one in Romania, the one in Estonia, the one in Poland, they all like all had a spouse that was um, from that country. Um, others wanted different things, you know, like my older refu uh, refugees um, um, often wants to go for um, sunshine. So um, Richard Fairhead, who's in Cyprus, um, uh, Chris, who's in Greece, you know, they wanted to go for the better weather. Um, and um, uh, Andy Parker, he's, he, he's uh, my Brexit for Bulgaria. He's the only one that's not made it there yet. He has a house there, which has been his holiday home for several years, but he was going to retire and um and and move there this year but then because of the covid 19 pandemic he postponed that but again it was it's for the better weather but then um you know for ollie who's in um brussels he moved for work because uh, he works for the european commission and that there's uh, work opportunities skylar who's in sweden got a job teaching maths and international schools so I don't think it's like, is there a best country? The most popular countries, um, when I put out posts on social media, say, you know, asking for, for people to, to say where they'd move to, the most popular countries were Germany, uh, the Netherlands, um, France, Spain, as you might expect, uh, Ireland as well, of course, because that's um, English speaking. So if you don't have language skills, then um, Ireland was a, a, a top pick. Um, because obviously that was one of the biggest barriers when I did my interviews with my uh, with my Brexiles I asked them what what was the biggest challenges that you faced when moving and it was it was the bureaucracy and the languages the language barrier that was the recurring um, challenges. Now I understand why they don't want to go to Italy. <laughs> My Brexal in Italy is really struggling to learn Italian. He says he's been he's tr been trying for t for, for years um, and he's not getting anywhere. What's the what's the most challenging bureaucracy or the language? <laughs> also the bureaucracy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, he he basically said that he managed to get like his residency card or something like that by um uh, having a chat with the town mayor or something like that. Mm. So he sort of got himself known personally and made a you know a personal request and he, and it managed to get sorted out, but not through um not through um the you know uh, normal standard. <laughs> so 
So there's uh, the the crown uh, effect here uh, because there's a, a question from Cecile uh, who's asking if there's a link between Brexit and the royal family and what is the position of the Queen on Brexit? I would say apart from her blue and yellow dress that she wore uh, uh, a few years ago. I actually sent a couple of my books uh, to the royal family oh, and I got a letter back from, I think it was from Prince Charles. Um, yeah, so I kept that. I Obviously they have to be completely tight-lipped, they can't say anything about politics or get involved in any way, but I think that um, Harry and Meghan's decision to leave leave the UK and move to America um, is, is, was partly politically um, uh, motivated. And I, I know there was a, an occasion where Meghan Markle kind of, um, I can't remember quite what it was that she did, but she made some gesture that indicated that she was pro-EU. Um, and um, even in, um, you know, the Queen's Christmas features, uh, there's kind of like subtle messages that they're not really happy with what is happening to this country um, and um, the direction that it's taking. And yes, that hat was the most kind of overt um, symbolic uh, indication of um, of her political views. Uh, and I also think it indicates the real importance of, um, of visual statements and uh, costumes in, in campaigning and activism. Obviously that was like a big thing for me was always like the costumes um, because each one made a political statement, whether it was like the bollocks to Brexit costume or the, the EU super girl, the EU wonder woman, the NHS EU nurse. You know, each time I was making a, a statement that was bold and, and visual, um, but also, you know, trying to add theatre and, um, um, you know, a sense of drama and performance to the campaign to make it more interesting because, you know, actually Brexit can get a bit tedious and boring uh, at times, particularly when they're getting down into the nitty gritty details that not everybody understands. And I think with politics, just to make a very simple and, you know, uh, um, uh, statement is sometimes the most powerful thing to do. Um, Paolo, another question or should I ask uh, no, Please, please go on, Catherine. Okay. Um, okay. Um, a short question, but a very large one. If you could change one thing about the UK political system, what would it be? A question from Steve, from Steve Hunt. Oh, well, I mean, absolutely fundamentally, the, the, the first past the post system has got to go. Um, it's, it's completely undemocratic. Um, it's, it's, it's similar to um, the US uh, electoral system where you, you, know, you, you see the US switching from one side to the other because they've got this binary system where um, it's only ever possible for two parties to have power. Um, we see that in the UK, um, that it's either Labour or, or the Conservatives and the Lib Dems have ad admirably got some ground and, you know, got, you know, a handful of MPs in the Parliament, but it's, it's nothing come, you know, in, in, in the context of the, of the whole Parliament, their influence. And it's not for, you know, their lack of hard work and conviction in their values, etc. It's to, to do with a system that is set up to, uh, to only allow two parties to have power. And we saw in the last general election, Boris Johnson did not win the popular vote. He won, I think it was 46% of the votes, but he has got a landslide uh, majority of like 80 MPs now um, because of the way the system is set up. And um, we saw within constituencies, you know, um, parties having to stand down because, um, you know, um, the Lib, the Lib Dems, for example, saying we're not going to stand in this constituency because we're just going to take away votes from the Labour Party and that's going to enable the Tories. And when you get into this um, situation where it's all about tactics and game playing and it's not about this honestly just saying to people, we stand for this, 
if you support this, you can vote for this. Instead, people are going, well, if I vote for them, that gives the other side a greater chance of getting in. So I'm not going to vote for what I truly believe in. I, it's totally messed up. It leads to this really convoluted thinking. It's undemocratic. And um, it also means that there's only, you know, it's a binary choice. You've got a binary political choice in a world that is a complete, you know, multiplex of, of issues. And if we want diverse representation in the parliament, to represent the diversity of our communities and our society, then we have to bin a binary electoral system. Mm. And for me, I um, I was a member of the um, the Lib Dems um, before the last general election. I've actually uh, dropped my membership because I my feeling now is that the only way we are going to get to a fair electoral system in the UK is um, for the Labour Party to back to get into power and to back um, electoral reform. That's the only way it's gonna happen. Um, there's, there's no way uh, of, uh, of a coalition um, uh, government um, getting in. And it's, it's a really difficult situation. And for me, it's quite depressing and challenging to think, you know, who do I align with? Do I want to support a party that has a greater chance of getting an electoral system I want? Um, but ultimately, I think that's the first thing that's got to happen before we have a fair democracy in the UK. OK, two more questions about politics and one question, you know, about the, the media. Uh, one from Tony Stopira. Uh, sorry if I don't pronounce the name correctly. To Maddy, do you think um, we in the UK will ever be free of the terrible hold of the hard right wing media? Uh, of the hold that it has over the population, or at least a large proportion of it. And maybe I ask another one straight away, then you can answer both. Um, at the ACIT conference this week, we discussed the steps needed to establish European citizenship, including UK nationals. Do you think this will help the UK citizens to feel and be more included in the new AU culture and identity? That was a question from Leslie from Brussels. Okay. Um, so I, I think that the British media has a huge responsibility for um, Brexit um, because um, I explained earlier the lack of political education um, in the UK. Uh, a lot of people don't understand the EU, what it does, what it's for, even very well educated people, even people that voted Remain. My friend voted Remain, but she still didn't really know what the EU was and what it does. I was the same. I did a lot of research and created this 24 Reasons to Remain um, poster and fact booklet um, um, uh, because I felt there was this deficit of knowledge. Now, um, that deficit of knowledge is coming from the lack of political education in schools for children, but for adults, where they get their political knowledge and information from is from the media. And if you've got a media that's dominated by the right wing, that's, that's you know, churning out uh, right wing propaganda and rhetoric and ideas that are all leaning to that, political persuasion, then that's the information that the public absorb. And if they don't know otherwise, they don't hear any alternative views, they don't hear any of this information being challenging, challenged, then they'll start to believe it. And we have um, a media in the UK, which is, I'm sorry, but dominated by Nigel Farage. He is the face that you just see everywhere, um, particularly all over the BBC. Oh. Um, and, um, but in general, you know, um, the platform is often given to very extreme right wing um, uh, voices, uh, like Claire Fox, for example, who set up the Institute of Ideas, was given like a prime slot on um, the uh, Radio 4 program, uh, The Moral Maze, and now she's been given a, a, a you know, a knighthood, um, in, she's in the House of Lords now. Um, and she, and um, she, she always holds really extreme um, views. And it's partly because extreme views sell, you know, it's clickbait, they get more traction on social media, the more controversial, controversial the, uh, the opinions and the headlines, the more content gets shared, the more papers get bought, etc. the more views on the TV. 
Um, but it's also to do with who owns the media, obviously not in the case of the, the BBC, the, uh, which is being held to ransom by the government. Um, but in, in terms of the, the free uh, media, you know, like Sky News, um, it's, um, you know, it's, it's owned by people that have a vested interest in, uh, in Brexit happening because uh, it's in their financial interests. Um, and that's just led to this situation where this kind of toxic nationalist dialogue where you can't get a foot in if you have a pro you uh, or, you know, left wing um, uh, uh, viewpoint very often. There was a number of times, for example, where the BBC stood me, da stood me up, like they'd invite me onto a programme and then they'd turn me down, like say, oh, we don't want you anymore. And this doesn't just happen to me, but to a lot of pro EU campaigners that I know. Um, even even publications like The Guardian um, and The Independent that you'd expect to be pro-EU, etc., very rarely are not. Just this week, The Guardian published an article by Owen Jones, who's a Labour Party activist, saying that Brexit is the fault or hard bre or the uh, hard Brexit is the fault of the Remainers for you know for being. Uh, uh, for being too pro EU or something, I don't know. It was a ridiculous article published in the Guardian. They did, um, they did a feature. There was one. I was, I was interviewed for the Guardian on one occasion, and um, it was part of a feature piece on the Remain movement, where they described us as Remainists, as in extremists, and I was, uh, I was described as having a cult of followers. Um, and you know that's the supposed liberal press in the UK. So it's really being held with a, a right, you know, uh, a right wing persuasion. And if people aren't hearing views from the other side, it's it's it, you know it's that's shaping their opinions. It's shaping the public dialogue, and it's going to make it incredibly hard to create a pro EU movement that leads us to rejoin the EU if we can't get any media coverage. That's the reality of the situation. We and need to, whether... be able to read the European press and Vox Europe then. Sorry, it was... Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got invited um, one year, I think it was 2018, to speak at the, um, the Brussels Press uh, Club after they did their ED, uh, EU media poll survey. And um, what I noticed from studying the, you know, the publications that were highest up on the poll of being read, like Politico and the Financial Times, and um, um, the European media platforms like Vox Europe, was that they are so much more um, information focused. They're educative. They're informative. Um, they they don't go in for these sensationalized headlines um, and um, they don't you know just want to put on contrary views just to uh, just to you know get attention basically it was quite a shock to see the contrast between that and then what we have in the uk mm. so um a couple of more questions a bit more personal and then i will keep uh, one of the last for my curiosity when it comes from peter miles who's asking if you do speak other languages at all and if you don't are there any european languages you would like to learn and the second one is from suzanne plazer who would like to know how do you keep sane and look after your well-being in this very ongoing difficult situation and after investing years of energy into campaign so um um, 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 languages. Languages. I um, I don't unfortunately speak foreign languages very well. It's it's kind of symptomatic of of the education. I said that my school that I went to um, didn't um, didn't have a lot of funding or investment in languages. So the only language that I had the opportunity to learn at school was French. Um, and there was a limited number of classes. The French exchange for my year group was cancelled. There weren't all the French, the other French trips also got cancelled. So um, I did study French to standard level on the International Baccalaureate Diploma. Um, and I got a level seven in that, which is like an A star. So I kind of, I did that okay, but actually speaking it in a conversation with someone, I still find really quite challenging uh, to like, you know, think on my toes. And 
I did learn some Mandarin <laughs> for two years. Uh, that well, um, when I was uh, living in Sheffield, started living in Sheffield. Um, my dad um, was doing um, research into uh, the Chinese education system. So he started attending Mandarin classes. Um, and so I went along with him. So for about two years, I learned some Mandarin. Um, and uh, I can say, um, which means I have a white dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, but other than that, Alba. Really a lot. <laughs> what is she called Alba? Yeah, Jiao Alba. <laughs> okay, I, with a Twitter account. Yeah, she has a. She has. A, I mainly use Alba's Twitter account to troll myself with. Oh, okay. <laughs> so when my so when people like trolls on my music videos are like, you sound like a howling dog. <laughs> then I get Alba to like reply to them saying, yes, yeah, she does. She's been taking lessons from me. <laughs> okay. Didn't you tour with uh, Europe with Alba as well? No. Um, you did. Okay. It's, it's actually um, not all the EU countries are part of the EU pet passport scheme and you have to get like um, different no, okay. vaccinations and things. So it's, and a lot of um, hotels are not dog friendly and also taking them on pl 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 planes you can't do either. Right. Um, so, uh, no. And I have actually been trying to learn German um, during the lockdown. I was using uh, Duolingo to, um, to, to do it. But it's one of those things, again, where I've done a lot of the reading and the writing um, and the listening, but I've had no practice to actually speak it, um, which is a shame. But I did learn a song in German. <laughs> it's called uh, mein, Her mein Herz braut eine Pause. <laughs> Yeah, so Which you, but leads me on to the next question of yeah, it was about your how do you stay sane? Yeah, basically. <laughs> yes. um, because it's it's been really difficult. Um, in, for me personally, because like I dropped out of my degree, and it was a case of like, how do you just keep managing to keep going, um, and um, uh, having that kind of like confidence in yourself or confidence in what you're doing as a cause to actually you know um keep making like a i guess kind of a personal sacrifice of like um uh you know not like pursuing a, your career or whatever um but um i found um i found 2019 extremely challenging um especially in terms of like the impact on my mental health because um, firstly, I was exhausted from the traveling because I did the 27 countries, but I also got invited to multiple events in the same country. So like I went to Germany eight times in 2019. Uh, Italy, I did uh, twice. Um, Br Brussels, I must have done at least eight times. I lost count of how many times I went to Brussels. Um, and um, so that was like very like tiring and um, um, and when you're tired, it's difficult to even think straight. At the same time, I was ex receiving a huge amount of trolling mm. on social media. Um, and it was, I remember it was especially bad just when Boris Johnson became prime minister um, in August. That was when the really bad trolling started. And um, just like every kind of abuse that you could possibly imagine. It's like... Mm. It's funny now because if anybody trolls me, I'm just like, well, I've seen that before, you know, like there's nothing, there's nothing new, but it's when it's like really intense and just relentless, it does really get to you. And the thing that hurt me most um, on like an emotional, personal level was um, when Remainers turned against me. Mm. So um, there was a lot of um, uh, people within the Remain movement that were, I don't know, um, maybe jealous or just frustrated at what was happening with Brexit. And they saw me as like an easy target to take that out on. And then they just, um, they would, you know, they'd troll me and they'd make slurs about me and stuff on social media. And that was really hard to deal with because they weren't attacking me because of my political opinions. They agreed with my political opinions. They were attacking me personally for being an attention seeker, for being a self-publicist for mm. being you know um uh, uh, they accused me of not taking the campaign seriously this is like something that i've devoted my life you know to for 
four years to then accuse me of uh, not taking it seriously and making a joke out of it um, because basically they didn't like my approach of wearing costumes and singing songs and um, whatever it that that was really really difficult and actually for me the COVID-19 pandemic has been uh, a blessing in disguise because um, it it you know it really put a stop also you know like Brexit happening in January at the same time it, it did put a stop on on all the traveling and the protests because people couldn't gather in public spaces anymore um, the Remain movement completely lost its momentum and fell apart and that's given me like a pause where um, actually I've had like a time to reflect and to do things more positively for me which was this like Brexiles project you know finding all these people and doing the artwork um, and reflecting on like the consequences of Brexit on people's lives um, but in in like my own way where I'm not being bombarded by other people all the time um, was actually really uh, helpful for me I think um, and I have to say I wouldn't be able to like go back to doing that you know the kind of um, political activism that I was doing before because it does really take a toll on you and I've heard also from people involved in refugee movements involved in the climate movements involved in the Labour Party that a lot of similar experiences happen within those you know movements as well and it's things like sexism it's things like ageism i had incidents of um you know sexual assault of verbal abuse things like that from older men in the movement and and it's not like something that anybody wants to have to go through but i've heard also stories of this happening in in other physical movements and it's almost like a like just something that you have to deal with and that's horrible you decided to steal on Twitter anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yes, well, Twitter does have its good sides as well, yeah. I think. I've had a lot of people like reach out to me on Twitter in a positive way. I've met, you know, um, uh, like uh, friends who also experience trolling after like retweeting me or commenting on one of my tweets and then they, my, they attracted my trolls and they got in touch with me to say, I this is really shocking and I don't know how you deal with it because it's hurtful for me. Oh. And actually that shared conversation is, is nice, but also, um, you know, when you put out something that is really successful, like my music videos, uh, I think I must've had about six or seven music videos that went viral on Twitter. And uh, for sure there was a lot of trolls on the music videos, but also a lot of people that, you know, um, supported uh the message and enjoyed the the content that i had um that me and my videographer uh, editor had had made and that's you know that's a nice that's a positive thing okay i don't know how much more time uh, we have maybe we can take two one or two more quick question if that's okay with you Madalena. one is can you explain a little bit more about the brick size project Oh, cool. Yeah. So, um, yeah. in 2018, I won the Young European of the Year Award and um, that award comes with a funding grant of 5,000 euros um, to normally um, the uh, awardee will do um, an internship at the European Parliament with, with, a, with an MEP, but um, you can also use it for a, for a project of your choice. And um, for me because i'm more um i'm more of a creative than a politician i want to use the opportunity to do something um creative and artistic with the funding so it basically um i used it to do this project where um my mission was to find one british citizen for each eu country uh, and to interview them to paint a portrait and then to have all of these portraits together um, as a representation of the the Brexiles who have left um, who have left the UK, and um, um, it was really interesting to have these conversations with um, different people like Simon, um, but of all ages, um, and um, uh, and to explore their experience of of migration, um, and then I put out the interviews on social media. 
Um, so whenever I finished a portrait, I would put the portrait on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, um, with a link to the interview or the interviews are on my blog collectively. And, um, um, at the end of the project, I did a crowdfunder to, um, raise a print, uh, to do a print run of the books, which got sent out to all my crowdfund backers. So that's the, the book, which has all the portraits and the interviews, um, together in the project. And um, the, 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 the project uh, was a, given an award, um, which is uh, the EU IDEA um, Visual Award for Framing Brexit. Um, and um, they're, that, they're going to present the work at their conference in, in Brussels next December, um, which will be an opportunity to share these um, stories. And really what I wanted to do with the stories was kind of, it's almost a guidebook of how to leave the UK. Um, so if you did want to Brexile, then um, uh, there's a lot of information in there of like, um, that might inform your choice of which country go to or and thing challenges that you might face, etc, and how to overcome them. But it's also interesting because these people are all people that have very pro European values, to the point where they're willing to make personal sacrifices to turn their you know to to uh turn away from their jobs their uh their, their family their friends their lives in the uk and to choose a different future based on values on european values and ideology and therefore their perspectives on uh, what's happening in the uk is actually really insightful and interesting for pro-eu companies campaigners across europe to learn from um and um some of the countries were harder to find participants for than others um and um the th the three hardest countries were um lithuania uh cyprus and hungary and um I, I was quite amused when I put up this post on um, Facebook to say, I'm really struggling to find someone for Hungary. Can anyone help me? And um, an, a Hungarian EU citizen living in the UK commented under the post saying, Hungary is not exactly going to be the prime destination of um, you know, refuge for someone that wants to escape a nationalist <laughs> government <laughs> um, and culture. Okay, thanks, Marina. I, I had a, um, a last question I, I kept for the end that I wanted to, uh, to ask you. So what would be uh, your next political battle and also your next, next artistic project? <laughs> and then um, we'll wrap this up. <laughs> it's, that's a good question because um, I don't really know is the answer. Um, I think, it's, I mean, for me, in the UK, the real stumbling block is the first past the post system, which I explained earlier. And therefore, there needs to be a campaign for electoral reform before really anything uh, major can happen in the UK. I think it's going to be a long campaign, and I don't know if that's my battle or not. But in terms of a rejoin campaign, now is not the time for that. Um, I think the wounds of Brexit, well, they're not, they're yet to be felt, never mind to heal before we can start talking about rejoin so i'd like to get more involved in the environmental movement um that was actually something that i was doing pre-brexit because i was living in the peak district and i was um organizing a like an eco arts project that was about helping disadvantaged group from urban areas to access nature and wildlife so for me uh, i'd love to get more involved in environmental activism now um but um uh, in terms of creative projects, I, I just don't know. Um, it depends where you can get funding and support and stuff from. In the UK, that's not easy to come by, particularly if you're of like a pro-EU political persuasion. I think it can be a bit um, uh, of a bit of a turn off for maybe different things. You know, for example, um, the government is putting a lot of funding, um, I think it's about, is it about 40 million pounds or something, into the festival of Brexit which is going to be a cultural celebration of, of, of Brexit in the UK. So I'm sure all the pro Brexit artists of which there are very, very few will get a, you know, prime slot at the festival of Brexit. But 
Well, who's um, the most prominent? We'll see. Sorry. Who's the most prominent um, pro-Brexit artist? You don't want to make any publicity, do you? <laughs> I'm curious. <laughs> um, Ringo, I think Ringo Starr is. Um, obviously, drummer from the Beatles was came out as pro-Brexit. Um, I hmm. met, uh, I actually was, I'm actually in contact with the guy that runs artists for Brexit, which is a thing. You can find them on Twitter. Uh, he's very nice, actually. Um, we've had some nice conversations together um and he gave me their publication of artwork um that ah, simon says simon says morrissey and noel gallagher ah uh, yes morrissey, what a disappointment <laughs> <laughs> so yeah there's a few there's a few musicians um even um uh, James Blunt got hounded on uh, Twitter for saying that um, that Brexit should just happen because I don't think he was necessarily like pro Brexit to begin with, but then he was like, yeah, just it needs to happen, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, which is it's a bit galling for musicians, particularly <laughs> because the visa for for, for travelling performing artists um, and um, the loss of international talent that is going to happen because of Brexit. Um, it's I know a lot of um, musicians who are on, you know, on the breadline, only just managing to make ends meet and the the visas and additional costs of, um, you know, car nets and um, um, for their merchandise and their equipment and stuff is going to put them out of being able to do their livelihood.